Wickham at Lion Ames Pool Shepherd. I'm a member of the Exist, uh, Exist Steering Group. Uh, just a few words, if I may, before we start the proceedings uh, today. First of all, I would like to uh, express my thanks to the University of Exeter and the Living Systems Institute in particular uh, for allowing us to host this meeting uh, here today. It's a great setting and very appropriate for the, uh, for the, subject, matter, uh, the subject matter. So thank you very much indeed to the university. Exist is now approaching, uh, I'm horrified to say, its seventh anniversary uh, with this uh, event being the 25th meeting, uh, quarterly meeting that we've held. So this is actually our, our silver jubilee uh, and all without repeating any subject matter. Uh, so I think that's quite a, quite a milestone and thank you all for, uh, for taking part here today. The contribution that Exist has endeavoured to make to uh, science and technology uh, the Exeter Science and Technology community uh, over these years is primarily due to two groups of people and I would like to acknowledge those, those two groups of people. The first of those uh, is our sponsors and supporters. Uh, they have provided the resource that's allowed us to do uh, what we have done both to exist and to function uh, over the years and I and my colleagues are very grateful uh, to those supporters uh, for uh, their support and involvement. So thank you very much indeed. Secondly, uh, I'd like to acknowledge those that participate in the uh, Exist Steering Group. Under the great chairmanship of Robert McElrath, it's this group that's responsible for the initiation, uh, for the development uh, and the enactment of everything that Exist does. Every monthly meeting uh, that we have uh, draws somewhere between 10 and 25 participants uh, these are key people from the university, from colleges, from the hospital, professional organisations, service companies, and most importantly, businesses, uh, and the Met Office, I mustn't mention it, mustn't forget the Met Office, um, uh, from the uh, businesses from the Exeter, uh, Exeter area. Um, the great thing about uh, these people is that they are there because they want to be there, not because they have to be there, and the success of Exist is very much due to their, uh, their involvement. We're very much an inclusive organisation. There's no limit, there's no qualification uh, on who may attend our meetings. All that we ask is that you have some interest in science and technology and uh, wish to see the STEM community in and around Exeter uh, grow, to, um, uh, uh, grow to the common good. If there's anybody here, uh, or you know of anybody, uh, that would like to join the Exist uh, Steering Group, uh, then that would be very welcome indeed. If you want further details, please see me uh, either at the end of the meeting, uh, or indeed turn up to uh, one of our uh, um, monthly meetings. We meet every month, first Tuesday of the month normally, uh, we start at 8.30, the meetings never run for more than 90 minutes, I promise you that, uh, at least they haven't in seven years, which is a credit to the chairman as much as anything, um, and you'll be very welcome. The next meeting is on the 6th of March, Tuesday the 6th of March, and is uh, here at the uh, Innovation Centre on the university campus. So that's enough of the uh, exist promotional and recruitment. Turning to today's presentations, uh, these all focus on translational science, and this is something that's very close to my heart. I've been involved to a greater or lesser extent in, uh, in such a subject for the last, getting on 40 years, I'm afraid. Um, I really look forward to hearing from Olivia, Chris, Oliver, Adrian, um, and their particular elements of their particular journeys as they try to take science from the bench to the bedside. So, without uh, further ado, I will hand over to your chairman for today, Professor John Terry, uh, who will take you through the, uh, through the proceedings. So, thank you, everybody. John, all yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I'd like to add uh, my own welcome to you all to the fabulous Living Systems Institute. It's really great to have you all here today as we, as Paul mentioned, hear more about some of the fantastic research, development and innovation taking place in the translational uh, medicine space. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities for 
interacting with us here in the Living Systems Institute. But before I do that, I'd just like to introduce our Deputy Vice-Chancellor for External Engagement, Professor Mark Goodwin, who will say a few words on behalf of the university. Mark. Thanks very much, John. Um, absolutely delighted to be here this morning. Thanks very much for the invite to come along and say a few words. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you all here to the Living Systems Institute. This is a, a 52 million pound investment by the university, and we actually think it's probably the best 52 million pounds we've ever spent. Um, so it's, it's fantastic to be sitting here in this building. Um, and we think it's money well spent because this, this institute is pioneering new approaches to tackling plant, animal, and human disease. And it's doing that in an interdisciplinary way. So I think it's particularly appropriate that we're all here this morning to hear about the exciting developments in translational medicine and in the research being pioneered here at Exeter and indeed beyond. That's because translational medicine is a really important part of our research strategy. Um, it builds on our existing strengths in clinical and translational research, in biosciences and systems biology, in diabetes and chronic disease, uh, in public health, clinical psychology, mood disorders, and in exercise and health science. And all of these, I think, are areas in which the university can play its role in acting as a scientific hub for the city and indeed in acting as a scientific hub for the region. We are very open for collaboration. We're open for service work. Our facilities are available. We're open for consultancy and we're very open for trialing interventions. And whether it's examining genetic pathways, creating diagnostic tools, undertaking uh, health economics or uh, environmental risk assessments, or even performing clinical trials for drugs or medical devices, the university strives to develop more strategic partnerships for specific indications and technologies across a number of business sectors in this particular area. I just want to set out a few of those now. Um, we're delighted to be able to work with partners to provide solutions in diabetes, in dementia, in aging, in cardiovascular metabolic disease, in epigenetics, neurodegenerative disease and mental health. And we also deliver uh, elite sports performance and product innovation, particularly in nutrition and wearables. And if you saw the recent attempt to run a marathon in less than two hours that Nike did in uh, Italy, that was our sports scientists who got the runners within, I think, 20 seconds of doing a two-hour marathon. So there's a huge amount of work that goes on here. Um, and of course, also um, interventions in bioinformatics and uh, imaging, some of which you'll, you'll hear about this morning. So as, as you can see, um, external engagement is really important to the university. And working with business and industry is critical to us. It helps us to continue to make an impact on the world, and it helps us to support you in making advances in all of these crucial technologies. But you might ask, well, you know, why is working with business so important to the university? Aren't you a research and a teaching institution? Well, yes, we are, but actually, each year, we partner with um, over a thousand projects. We, we work with external partners on over a thousand projects. Those projects have a total value of over 50 million pounds per annum. So this is, this is really important to us as a university. Um, and we're delighted to be able to do that. We work with companies, larger companies in the area like Supercat and Ginsters, uh, A&P. We work with the Met Office, we work with the Eden Project, but we also work with a whole host of uh, SMEs and, and small companies, and we're absolutely delighted to do so. And if you want to explore a partnership with us, then these are the people who can help you. We've established a new professional services directorate called uh, Innovation, Impact and Business. They're uh, appropriately located in the uh, Innovation Center. And, and they're the team that provide that uh, externally facing work. And they're the team that broker all of these partnerships. So if you are interested, these are the people to contact. And there's some details up there. Um, we work with business and in industry. And indeed, business and industry works with us for three key reasons. Um, the, the first of which is because of the world-class nature of our research and development. Um, 
The second is, is to access highly skilled people, whether that's our academics or our students. And the third is because we can help you innovate with new technology and new processes. But across all of those areas, I think our partners really work with us because of our people, be, because of the exceptionally talented and skilled staff and students that we have here. And at the moment, we have staff and students here from over 140 countries around the world. And that means that we've got some of the best talent from around the world right here on your doorstep, and you can draw on that talent, and we're very uh, pleased to make that talent available. Why is this important for business and the economy? Well, although the UK economy grew faster than any other major advanced economy bar Germany last year, our productivity is still a crucial problem. Indeed, it takes us five days to make what Germany and the US make in four. And what that means is that our workers are paid less and they work longer hours to produce the same amount of output. And although the city of Exeter is an exception, productivity in the region as a whole here is at about 85% of the UK average. And what we need to do is to make sure that we're helping businesses in the region to drive innovation, to drive productivity, and to drive growth for the, for the benefit of everybody in the area. And we're, as I say, very pleased to be able to do that. Um, so if you like, that's become a third mission for us, alongside research and teaching. And indeed, we now try and integrate it across all of our research and teaching activities. We're also, of course, a business in our own right. Um, our turnover this year will be about 450 million pounds. We employ about 4,500 staff. Um, our current economic impact on the Southwest is about 1.1 billion. We inject about 1.1 billion pounds annually into the Southwest uh, economy, either through our own spending or through the purchasing power of our staff and students. What we want to do is to use all of that uh, to try and benefit businesses and companies in, in the Southwest. So as a university, we're very committed to fulfilling our potential as a motor for regional growth, but we're, we're very aware we can only do that if we work together with local businesses to support innovation and to increase productivity. I'm afraid I have a whole set of meetings now in Cornwall, um, and actually I'm talking to people in Cornwall about the industrial strategy and about how the university can help the industrial strategy in Cornwall, so I've got to dash off. Um, I wish I could stay because I think it's a fascinating set of talks. I've watched some of these companies develop. It's really great to see some of our staff bring their companies through to fruition and it's always fantastic when that happens. Um, so I'm afraid I've got to scoot off but I want to thank you again for the invite. Um, I also want to thank you for your continuing support and engagement in Exist. I think science and technology are crucial for this city. This is going to be the analytical city. Um, it's crucial for the region and obviously it's crucial for the country so thank you for all you're doing to boost that and we as a university will do what we can to help you do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Thank you. And uh, as chair, I'm already doing a terrible job because we're a few minutes behind. So I'm going to keep this bit very brief because I want us to get into the speakers and hear about our fantastic speakers. So if I just grab the all important pointer. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about translational research at Exeter and in particular what's going on here in the LSI from the perspective of our team. So We've, over the last few years, built up a group of approaching 50 principal investigators, researchers, and PhD students. And our group focuses on what we term dynamic non-communicable health disorders. So these are things like autoimmune disorders, diabetes, and other endocrine disorders, neurological conditions like epilepsy, dementias, cardiac conditions, arrhythmias. So where the symptoms perhaps wax and wane over time, or the measurements that we use to make diagnosis and prognosis of those conditions may well not be static. So we could take a measurement now and another, another measurement in a couple of hours and it could be quite different. What does that actually mean? Is it relevant to the disease or is that just natural variation in our body's rhythms? So we use mathematics, imaging, bioinformatics techniques to try and understand some of these conditions with a view to translating those into better diagnostic and prognostic techniques. Now, 
One of the things that I think is important to mention, Mark mentioned it briefly, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, the government are injecting 4.7 billion between last year and 2020 into research and development. And in the particular space we're talking about today, they're making a particular push for early diagnosis and precision medicine, healthy aging, and accelerating innovations in healthcare and medicine. Also last year, a report by Sir John Bell was commissioned, the Life Sciences Industry Strategy, and that highlighted the need for partnerships between academics and industry. Uh, it highlighted the need to support SME growth, and also to train a new generation of quantitative scientists. So there's a great opportunity for us all to partner together, and I hope that in the talks we hear and in the dialogues afterwards, we can begin those uh, partnership developments. And in particular, in terms of training new generations of scientists. We're looking to put together a bid for a centre for doctoral training in this area. And so if anyone is interested in speaking to us about how they can get involved, how we can support training a new generation of PhD students, definitely get in touch with us afterwards. In terms of what we're doing here within the LSI, we're establishing a hub with a focus on translational research and we're recruiting uh, a number of positions in the coming 12 months, a business manager, industrial facing fellows funded from a variety of sources, as well as more basic research scientists to actually drive the new generation of translational research. So it's a really exciting time here in LSI and in the University of Exeter more broadly. And uh, we're really open for business as Mark says and really looking forward to talking with you and engaging with you in this journey. Now, enough from me because I think what's really exciting is to hear about some specifics of what's going, going on here in the Exeter area. And we've got four great speakers, the first of whom I'm very pleased to introduce, Olivia Champion, who is uh, going to talk to us about her journey from a uh, research fellow in the College of Life and Environmental Sciences through to CEO of a company. Looking forward to hearing it. And I'll hand straight over to you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's lovely to be here. I'm going to talk today about Biosystems Technology, which is a University of Exeter spin-out company. I thought I'd start the talk by describing to you how and why the company was formed and about how we developed our product. And then the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey from moving from academia into business and running the company. So the company was... Uh, co-founded in 2015 by myself and Professor Rick Tipball. Um, Rick is a professor here at the University of Exeter and I'm now working as CEO for the company and Rick is the CSO for the company. And we also have a finance director, Mike Stainer. And the company was really formed against a kind of a backdrop of the fact that there's an increasing number of mammals that are being used in research. And this is despite the fact that it's actually been government policy for around the past 20 years to reduce the number of mammals used for research. So these data are taken from the Home Office and you can see um, the years across the bottom and the numbers on the y-axis are actually in the millions. And if you just look at mice, you can see that the numbers are just going up. And that's continued since 2013. And one of the reasons for this increase in the number of mammals is because there have been no good alternatives. And so although mammals are an important tool for researchers and they're used in many different areas, there are a number of problems around their use. They're very time consuming to use. You have to plan the experiments out months in advance. There's also a lot of regulation around the use of mammals. You have to have a home office license. Getting that home office license and the project license can take up to a year. And that document is very inflexible. So once you have your plan through the home office license, you can't deviate from that plan. You have to stick rigidly to what you said you're going to do. There's obviously ethical issues around the use of mammals. But also, there's a very high cost associated with using mammals. So I've talked to quite a lot of people about the cost of using mammals in their research. And the consensus view is that if you're working in a containment level two laboratory, a single mouse costs around 200 pounds when you include the facility costs of working with those mice. And if you take those experiments into containment level three, a single mouse is costed up at 400 pounds per mouse because of the increased facility costs. <coughs> 
So obviously that really eats into grant budget and also if you're in industry that you know that's coming off your bottom line. There, there's a big cost associated with them. So during my time here in Exeter we started to look at alternatives that we could use to reduce the number of mammals used in our research and we started to look at insect larvae. We started to work with a, a larvae called Galeria melanella and we weren't the only people working with this insect larvae. People at the Pasteur Institute, the Max Planck Institute, Harvard Medical School were also working with Galeria melanella insect larvae <clears throat> and they were being used for applications such as microbial pathogenesis, drug discovery, toxicity testing. And this slide really summarizes how those insect larvae can be used. They can't completely replace the use of mammals, but they can be used at early stages in the research pipeline as a filter. So if we take the example of the discovery of new antibiotics, if each of these red spots represents a potential novel antimicrobial compound, traditionally each of those antibiotics would have been tested individually in groups of mice for their activity and for their toxicity. But Galeria melanella can be used as a filter, so we can test each of those compounds in the insect larvae and we can identify compounds that have the characteristics that we're interested in and then just take those compounds forward for testing in mammals. And the results that we get in the insect larvae match the results that we get in the mammals. So everybody who was working with these Galeria melanella insect larvae around the world, and there was a large body of scientific literature around their use, everybody who was working with them was faced with the same problem and that was that there was no standardized supplier of the larvae everybody was having to go to their local pet shop or buy them online from fishing bait shops and as you can imagine as a scientist that was you know really not an acceptable thing that had to happen for us but there was no alternative that's that you know there was no standardized supplier and so our business biosystems technologies business focus is to supply and breed genetically determined Galeria melanella larvae that have been quality controlled. So our larvae are aligned with a research mouse. We have a patent pending, we have genome sequenced the breeding colony, and we've also trademarked our product name. And just to give you an idea of a cost comparison, I said earlier that from discussions with people who are working with mice, a single mouse is costed up between 200 to 400 pounds when you include the facility costs. A single larvae costs one pound and there are no facility costs and no specialist equipment required. So there's a huge cost saving associated with working with the larvae. So our product is called True Larve and our larvae are age defined and they're weight defined. They're surface decontaminated, they're bred from a genetically determined breeding stock and importantly there's no antimicrobials and no hormones used in the breeding process and this does happen with these kind of larval, uh, the commercially bred larvae. And I said that everybody who was using these larvae traditionally was we were having to buy them as bait shop and this introduced a large amount of variability into our results and what we were hoping was that the results that scientists achieved working with true love would solve this reproducibility issue and that's really summed up in this slide. So there was a postdoc working in the group in Exeter and she was working with a pathogen um, and she had identified a putative virulence gene, she had made a mutant in the putative virulence gene and she was testing her wild type and her mutant in the Galeria melanella model in the bait shop larvae, the, you know, the pet shop larvae. And what she was finding is that she had what looked like a phenotype, and every time she repeated that experiment, she could see what looked like a phenotype, but she couldn't get the statistics to prove that phenotype because the error bars were so large. And she repeated that experiment over and over for around six months, and in the end, she had to just shelve that project because she couldn't conclude that the um, virulence gene, you know, was a virulence gene because she couldn't get the statistics. And so around this time we had developed True Love and we suggested that she try the experiment with True Love and she did and you can see the results here that these, these were three experimental replicates carried out over a two-week period. She could then demonstrate that the um, gene was associated with virulence. She had her 
um, nice uh, statistics, and this paper has now been published. So the use of true love in this example was the difference between whether or not a paper could be published and that work taken forward. So we've now gone on to um, sell the larvae as a product, and this um, figure really just indicates the, the increase in sales. So this is like-for-like like sales in January of each year. Um, so we just started some sales in January 2016, and from January 2016 to January 2017, we had a huge growth in our sales. And again, we've had almost 100% increase in sales like for like January 2017 to 2018. So our sales of the larvae um, have dramatically increased over, since we've been trading. And over the past couple of years, we've began exporting the larvae, and we're now exporting true larvae to 11 countries throughout Europe. And we also have other products now in our pipeline. So we offer training courses for um, potential customers who are interested in using the larvae, but they don't have the expertise in-house to use them. So people can either come to us, and we've run around seven training courses now in-house in Exeter, and we've had scientists come from across Europe to learn to use the larvae in Exeter. And we also offer in-house training, so we've been to some companies and offered the training there. We've won funding from Innovate UK to develop genetic tools um, to make transgenic larvae, to bring the larvae even more in line with research mice. Um, and th those uh, products will be available in the near future. And we also have been developing um, an imaging system and associated software so that we can use the larvae for high throughput screening. So that kind of summarizes the business, why we set up um, and the kind of, you know, how we're doing. And I thought I'd talk a little bit um, about my journey from working in academia to running the business. So this slide really summarizes my CV. I started um, at Cardiff University. I did an internship at the World Health Organization, worked for a couple of years um, with Public Health England, um, who were then called the Health Protection Agency as a clinical scientist, whilst doing an MSc at Queen Mary and Westfield University. I did my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a postdoc at UBC in Vancouver, and then I came to Exeter. So there was no kind of business background at all in my history, but it was during my time in Exeter that I really saw this gap in the market, and with support from the team over at the Innovation Centre, I formed Biosystems Technology. And I'm now working <coughs> full-time for Biosystems Technology. So my research interest had always been in infectious disease and public health. And during my research, I developed an interest in alternative research models. And during my time in academia, I won grant funding from the Veterinary Laboratory Agency to develop the Galeria Melanella model. I've, ha I've got over 20 research publications, which have had over 1,000 citations. I've published six book chapters, and I've got two patents. And I also have had three career breaks for maternity leave, and I have three children. So um, during the time, as I was saying, I was working with the alternative research model and we had this problem with the variability um, with the, the, the larvae that we were using. And an opportunity arose through um, the guys over at the Innovation Center called iCure. And iCure was funded by the Innovate UK. And if you had an idea for a potential um, commercialization of your research, you could apply to iCure. And Essentially, this gave you around £50,000 to buy out your time to carry out some primary market research to talk to people in the industry. You can talk to customers or other stakeholders to find out whether or not there is a potential business for your idea. And so at the end of those 100 or so interviews that I conducted, I was convinced that there was um, a business case to be made. And during those interviews, I talked to people who were policy makers around the use of mammals. So I talked to people at the Home Office. I had a visit to the Home Office. I talked to people at MHRA and at NC3Rs. And I also talked to potential customers. And our co potential customers are in industry. And I talked to people who you know, run the, the huge contract research organizations in academia. So I talked to other groups who were using the bait shop larvae to see whether or not they felt that there was a, a need for standardized larvae. And I also talked to people at the various government and laboratories, either people who were working with the, the larvae or people who were working with animals who would benefit from working with the larvae. 
So this is really the timeline of, of what's happened over these past couple of years. So I started on the IQ program in January 2015. And also in January 2015, I won funding from the university, Open Innovation Funding, to develop the IP, so to really kind of, which underpinned the business. In June in 2015, I trademarked the product name, so the True Love product name. And then in July, the limited company of Biosystems Technology was formed. In August of the same year, the patent was filed. And then in November, quite critically, we won more Open Innovation Funding, which was to beta test the product. So we had developed the product, we'd developed True Love, we'd filed, you know, we'd filed the patent, we had filed the name, and then what we did is we worked with a trusted group of customers who were potential customers, they weren't actual customers, people that we'd partnered with through research, you know, collaborators, people that I'd spoken to on the IQ program, to ask them would they test our product for us to see if they solved the issues. And that was a really important sort of stage in the journey. And then in November 2015, I was offered an opportunity to go to London um, to the Set Squared Investment Showcase to pitch the business idea in front of a, a panel of 250 or so um, angel investors. So it was like Dragon's Den, but much bigger, no Deborah Meaden. And the, um, that was a successful um, outcome. So we brought investment into the company in April 2016. And then our first, once we had the investment in, we really started sales of the model. So that really started in April. We had our first exports in June 2016. In September 2017, we've won um, investment from Innovate UK to start the um, development of the genetic tools. And in January 2018, we were exporting to 11 countries throughout Europe. Okay, sorry. So just um, to summarize, we had some really um, great support from the university in the formation of the company. Um, we had the, um, the general support in terms of conversations and um, IQ, but also in critical funding for critical points in this journey, so the open innovation funding and the opportunity to pitch for investment. And we've also won grant funding, so NC3R's funding to partner with industry. Um, we've won the MRC Proximity to Discover. Um, funding and Innovate UK funding, partnering with the university, with James Wakefield here at the university. So the team now looks like this. I'm the full-time CEO of the company, um, and really my role is sales and marketing, business development, product development. We've got a business manager who joined us in September 2016. She kind of does the operations, general and admin, the accounts. Um, when we won the funding from Innovate UK, we brought in Amy, um, and she was working on a transgenic Drosophila project at Harvard Medical School, and she's now working on our transgenic Galeria project, and Nazia Furi is in digital media. So this is our last slide, so thank you very much for having me. Um, please do stay in touch. You can follow us on Twitter if you're interested. Go to our website, there's more information on there. Um, or you can email us, and if you'd like to receive our monthly newsletter, then please let us know. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that, Olivia. That was a great talk. We do have time for a couple of questions from the floor. I think there's a roving mic, is there, somewhere? Oh, here it comes. So if you could just wait for the mic, if that's OK. So I think just over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting story. Uh, could you tell us a little about the obstacles you had to overcome? And, and is the market for this homogeneous, or are there different sectors which have different uh, obstacles to overcome? Yeah, so understanding the market was really critical, actually, and that was kind of what I, a big part of what happened during that IQ journey. And the market really, you know, I started out the market that I was aware of was microbial pathogenesis, because that was where I was working, and that's where most of the literature was. But there is actually a, a broader market, and, and one of the largest market um, sectors is in um, toxicity testing. Um, and especially acute toxicity testing. So uh, the acute toxicity model is uh, the rat oral model, and that has to be tested beforehand in cell culture. And the cell culture model is, is quite widely recognized, although it's the OECD guidance model, it's quite well widely recognized as being poorly predictive of the acute um, rat toxicity, and also quite variable between labs. So we've actually partnered with one of the big contract research organizations to compare True Love with um, the cytotoxicity method, and we've just had a paper accepted um, in Chemosphere Journal reporting the results, which show that the Galeria model is actually more effective for predicting toxicity. Um, so that's a large market. Mm. 
Okay, if there are no further questions at this time, Olivia, thank you very much indeed for that talk. Thank you very much. Double check, I get the speakers right. Yes, that's good. So the next uh, speaker, it's a great pleasure to introduce another colleague from the University of Exeter, Chris Thornton. Um, Chris is the director of ISCA Diagnostics and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Chris about ISCA and a bit about their journey. So Chris, welcome. I'll give you a two minute warning. Shall I do left, left, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, firstly, thanks very much for inviting me to uh, come and speak to you today. It's not a huge journey. I'm only over in the biosciences building, but here we go. Um, so I'm a, a professor at the university, so I'm a full-time academic. So I actually do the ISCA stuff as a sort of um, evening, weekend type thing. Um, but a lot of my research is really intertwined with ISCA. Um, and, and uh, vice versa, so uh, it's not too difficult to manage. So, um, okay, before I start my talk, here's, here's a statistic for you, or a, a figure. Fungi kill more people globally than malaria and tuber tuberculosis combined. Okay, so they're a massively important group of organisms, massively underreported in terms of, of human health, um, and one of the big players in that is, is Aspergillus diseases. So Aspergillus fumigatus causes 80%, over 80% of, of uh, disease in, in human beings. And it's one of the biggest killers of um, people with hematological malignancies. So leukemia patients who are neutropenic, they have no immunity, either because they have a, a stem cell transplant or they're uh, um, undergoing extremely aggressive um, anti-cancer therapies that knocks out their immune system. So fungi and in particular Aspergillus fumigatus, they're, they're opportunistic pathogens, they're pulmonary pathogens. We breathe that particular single organism in every day. Um, figures vary, but um, it, uh, anything from about 200 to 1,000 spores are breathed in every day by everyone sat in this room, okay? We're all uh, healthy or seemingly healthy and our immune system clears those um, spores, which are the uh, infectious agent that gets into the lungs. So that's what it looks like when it's growing in, in culture, looks fairly innocuous, but in the immune depleted lung, um, those spores will wake up within 24 hours and then they will produce invasive hyphae and those hyphae will invade through the lung tissue and that is a, um, a biopsy sample taken from the lung of a, a, a hemonc patient who's neutropenic and who um, um, is developing invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. That disease will kill you within roughly seven days unless it's diagnosed and, and treated with um, toxic azole uh, antifungal drugs. So it's the most important pathogen of hematological malignancy patients. Um, it's not massive numbers in terms of global health. Um, it's estimated that there's um, about 200,000 cases per year worldwide that are reported. It's not a disease that has to be reported, and that's a big issue. But the problem is its mortality rate. So it has, in some centers, up to 95% mortality rate. So it's something that kills very, very quickly, even um, if you can get drugs in. But the drugs usually go in too late. Um, so those aren't huge numbers, but actually it's becoming increasingly clear that at that, that single organism also causes uh, massive um, added problems to people with other respiratory diseases. So uh, it causes other diseases like chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. There's about three million cases worldwide in patients um, with underlying diseases like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and, and asthma. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, about four million cases worldwide in people with asthma and cystic fibrosis. So it's an important respiratory pathogen and it's allergenic. So it causes and exacerbates um, asthmatic symptoms. So it's an important organism. Diagnosing that invasive pulmonary disease is extremely difficult. What I've done is in, in the top left-hand corner is try to identify what I saw and what I've experienced as being the most important um, processes along the way if you're thinking of setting out into um, spin-out and developing a, a diagnostic company. So this is the route that 
that I've kind of um, identified along the way. So diagnosing the disease is extremely difficult. There's no single gold standard test for diagnosis. What typically happens is a patient will come in, um, they're neutropenic, um, they, they may have had a bone marrow transplant, they'll be on immun immunosuppressant drugs that makes them high risk. And they will typically have a fever that's unresponsive to antibiotics. So the first thing a, a doctor will do is they'll put them on broad spectrum antibiotics, suspecting that it's a bacterial infection. And what happens is that patient won't respond to, because it's not a bacterial infection, it's a fungal infection. And so what the clinician will do is they'll s then send them for a CT scan. So a scan of the chest using com computed tomography. And the radiologist will come back and say there's an abnormality. But that abnormality is completely nonspecific. It could be viral, bacterial, it could be a cancer, or it could be a fungal infection. And there's many fungi that can infect human beings as well, not just Aspergillus fumigatus. So it's not discriminatory. Um, a no large number of patients that go on to get IPA um, and die, they are only revealed as having that disease in autopsy, where they have um, different tissues taken, and you can see that the fungus has made it right through the kidney and to the liver, into the central nervous system, and you get cerebral aspergillosis as well. But these um, autopsies, they're rarely conducted nowadays in, in Western hospitals. Okay? So it's really, really important that you get the diagnosis as early as possible and that it's as accurate as possible. And the prognosis for the patient worsens significantly the longer you leave the diagnosis and you leave the patient untreated. What happens, though, is, and a clinician very rightly will say, I'm not going to wait for a diagnosis. And they will simply give them antifungal drugs because the patient has been unresponsive to antibiotics. They're, and they're in a high-risk group. They're known to be um, possibly infected with the pathogen, so they put them on antifungal drugs. The drugs are highly toxic. The fun a fungus is 95% related to us genetically, so there's very little you can go for in terms of a target that's not going to have side effects within a human being. Um, and so they get these toxic drugs. You get important, very nasty drug-drug interactions, so you have to get the drug regimens exactly right for the particular patients. Um, many patients don't toler them, tolerate the drugs particularly well. They call, cause all sorts of um, hallucinations and fevers lack of sleep, shaking, all sorts of things. And they're already very, very sick because they have a cancer and they're being treated for that. And typically, it adds about £25,000 to a hospital stay to diagnose and treat one of these patients with antifungal drugs. So they're very expensive and toxic. And the problem is they're being used um, without diagnosis, and it's leading to widespread azole resistance. So many of the clinical strains in humans are now azole resistant, so we're running out of options for actually treating these patients. And it's precisely the same story that's happened with antibiotics. Widespread, unnecessary use of antibiotics has led to widespread um, antibiotic resistance in bacteria. The same scenario is happening. So we really need much be better diagnostics. So the first thing in terms of a business is identify the need. There's a very clear need for improved diagnostics. So, um, what I did was to de develop a, a, a simple solution. I, and I've said simple up here. If you're going to design something, make it simple. Don't make it sophisticated. There's quite a number of companies that have actually produced uh, very sophisticated lab-based technologies, but no healthcare provider is going to buy it, OK, because they're about £500,000 per test, uh, per unit. OK? And then the test on top of that is additional cost to the healthcare provider. So you need something that's quick, easy to do, can be run by a single technician over the weekend when a sample comes in. Otherwise, you'd be waking, waiting for the next week to do the diagnostic run. And so what I did develop was um, a lateral flow device. So that here it is in my pocket. So it comes in a little packet. And so it's, it, it's highly portable. It works on exactly the same. Um, I can't even get into the packaging. No use. OK, so um, it works on exactly the same principle as a pregnancy test. The same technology is in this test. You don't pee on it. You test blood samples or fluids from the lung. Um, and basically, it, it contains an antibody that's specific to a biomarker that's produced by the pathogen as it becomes invasive. So if you see, 
you add the sample to the device where you have uh, the biomarker within the serum or uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid that's come out of the lung, you get two lines showing that the sample is positive for the biomarker, so they have an active infection. In the absence of the biomarker, you get a sim simple uh, single internal control line that shows that, that the test has run correctly. Okay? It's very quick. That, that was real time, adding the sample. Okay? So you're taking diagnosis now um, from days or even weeks in certain centers to actually being able to do this at the patient bedside with the bronchoscopy team. So they will take fluid from the lung, they will place it onto the test and you get the result within a matter of seconds if there's a lot of marker or within 15 minutes. So the maximum read is 15 minutes. So you can make an instant decision about whether to treat that patient or whether to hold off on these toxic um, uh, antifungal drugs. So second step, provide a really simple solution. It's, it looks simple, but actually it's incredibly sophisticated what's going on in terms of um, uh, fluid dynamics within that test. These um, plastic houses are made specifically for this single test. They have very specific pinch points along the membrane within that. So there's a huge amount of money and time and R&D that's gone in to develop that test. But it's portable, um, it's stable at room temperature, it's, it's stable for three years. Okay, so it can be transported easily and you can use it in developing countries where you have very limited um, um, diagnostic capabilities. So that's the test. Um, in terms of intellectual property, we protected the um, uh, antibody and its use in the lateral flow technology um, by patenting, and that was done by the university. Um, and that was done back in 2010. So the second thing is protect your IP. This is always a really um, difficult one if you're an academic. You're under massive pressure to publish. And really, if you, if you then go and publish and you put all the information in the public domain, you can't protect your pat by patent for obvious reasons. Okay? So this is the one thing I say to the university is you're going to have to give these people slack in terms of um, if they're not performing on the outputs, it's because they're trying to protect their IP. Okay? And the one thing I would say in terms of antibodies is, um, <laughs> to, to be frank, uh, it, it's an extremely expensive way to tell the world your secrets. Okay? Because you have to publish all of the information about the antibody, and anybody who's skilled in the art can, can go out and try and rip you off. Okay? Um, it's not easy, but it's doable. So, um, but clearly having a patent is something that attracts investment from venture capitalists and angel funders. So you have, to, you have to get the balance exactly right. And if you're heading out on this, you have to have some form of protection. Okay, but it's, it's getting that fine balance as an academic and being a business person and thinking along those two different lines. So we did protect our IP, um, and what we then did is, is we effectively primed the global market with these tests. Um, during the research and development, we were producing a lot of prototypes that we couldn't sell, but we could give them to various centers around the world so they could, they could beta test. And the beautiful thing was that most of them were academic clinicians, so they had a vested interest in um, the science, and they produ produced a lot of very nice papers for us saying how fantastic the test was. Okay? So for minimal cost to us, they did all the hard work in the publications. Most of them, they included me on the publication as well, which was very nice, so it helped me as an academic. Um, and so since 2008, there's been 13 clinical studies conducted and published on the lateral flow device against the current tests used in hospitals. Most of those have been done in the UK, US, Australia, Austria, Chile, Chile, very important market to us, strangely enough. Um, China, Germany, and also Turkey, another massive market for us, um, interestingly. Okay, so... Um, a Chinese group then did a meta-analysis using all of that data and showed how fantastic the test was. And actually, since then, there's been six more clinical studies. So um, this is the company. Um, it was formed in 2012. Um, we had HMRC, SEIS, tax relief for the investors. The university's got 25% ownership. I've got 41%, and the rest is made up of the uh, angel inven investors. 
Um, so that's how we do it. We, we um, the university is the licensor. We license the um, IP surrounding that antibody and the lateral flow technology. So the IP flows from the university into, into the product. Uh, so we're able to then get the R&D that I developed out of the bench, out of the lab, from the bench into the bedside. Um, one of the one critical thing um, that happened during this process is that I was extremely lucky to become an SME partner in a, in a large European consortium grant that's run from um, 2013 and it finishes in September 2018 this year. Um, and what we're able to do is we use that same antibody in a much more sophisticated manner. We actually take that antibody out of that test and we we um, conjugate it to copper 64, a radionuclide, and we can use it in positron emission tomography, um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So we inject the tracer into the bloodstream, the antibody flows into the lungs and it lights the fungus up within the lung tissues. So this is a mouse model of infection over here. I don't know if this is working or not. But over to the right hand side, you can see those hyper intense regions within the lung tissue. This is where we've got um, the fungal infection within the lungs and the tracer is showing that in an MRI scanner. So we, we've actually now, um, my role was to humanize that antibody and it's now going into human clinical trials um, this year. So it's currently going through toxicity testing um, and, and we'll be going into clinical trials in Germany uh, for use in humans. So with, with making that CT scanning, that MRI scanning, far more sophisticated and accurate. The other thing is, is expand your empire. So you have to think uh, long term. Not all of these things might necessarily come off. The lateral flow device has the, the um, MRI scanning may not because it's extremely expensive, but it's very cool science. Um, and so what we also do now is to sell all of the antibodies I've ever made as an academic over the past 25 years. So all of the antibodies that were sat in having been published and were never really going to go anywhere, I now sell them through e-commerce. So if you go to the ISCA website, you can buy these things by PayPal or SagePay. You simply click on your volume, gives you a price, the shipping cost, and I then box them up and send them out around the world. So um, a number went out uh, on Monday to the United States. Another lot is going out to the United States on this, this coming Monday. So it's generating money from academic research that had gone dead and everything was just sat in a fridge or a freezer, you might as well make use of it. And, and there's certainly a demand for it out there in the big wide world. So expand your empire, think big, think globally, try to increase your product range. And, um, and that's where, where I've been. This is where we've got to. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, the ISCA shareholders. I'd like to just um, briefly mention Jenna. Jenna was a uh, undergraduate here at Exeter in Biosciences. She got a first class honours degree in Biosciences and I taught her um, on one of the modules. She came to me after a lecture and said, could I come and work with you for a year? And she paid as a Masters by Research student to come and work with me in the labs for 12 months. And it coincided that the end of her project coincided with the European funding. So I took her on full time uh, for five years and, and really the European Union has kept this whole thing going, actually. It's gave, given me a pair of hands for five years, fully funded research scientist to, to do all of the sophisticated imaging work, but she also is a pair of hands in the lab. And you'll note, actually, there's not a single piece of financial support, <coughs> without wishing to sound bitter here, okay? Not a single penny for any of this work has come from the United Kingdom. MRC won't fund it, Wellcome wouldn't fund it, um, all the money's actually come from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, um, Pfizer Global, and also the European Union. Okay, so Brexit is a bit of a bummer when it comes to this kind of work. Okay, but I'd also like to find, find the guys in what were RK, RKT and now IIB who have helped along the way. And I'd really like to thank Paul Shepard, who's been a massive help over the last two years, who's come in um, to really guide me um, and give me a bit more business acumen than I, than, I, than I had. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, Chris. We've got time perhaps for one quick question, if anyone has one yet. Just uh, one over here. Just wait for the mic. Here it comes. 
So the, the MRI aspect is still in R&D, but the diagnostic kit, is that in use in the NHS? Uh, it, uh, it's about to be, yeah. So although the company was um, incorporated in 2012 and we thought everything was going to be <laughs> okay, we've had five years of, of massive technical problems scaling the whole thing up from the bench scale up to 50,000 device run manufacturing. Um, we've now cracked that and it's, it, it is literally about to be CE Mark next week. It then has to be taken into the NHS trust and, and audited within that before it can be used. It has to go into their, their diagnostic makeups before they'll accept it. So there's, there's many more hurdles to go. It's a little easier in places like Chile and Turkey. Turkey has the, the Minister of Health in, I have to be careful what I say, but basically they've, they're, they're gonna use it as their diagnostic for, for Turkey. In fact, talking of NHS Trust, perhaps we'll take one more question just at the front here. Uh, well, I am from the NHS Trust. Uh, have, you done, sorry. have you done this in conjunction with a clinician, or have you? Yeah. when did you start talking to clinicians in your journey? 2008. Yeah, and, and um, I would say the, the biggest door opened in London because they've got the biggest number of patients that need treating and they had massive problems with their diagnostics. So I, I got actually via Pfizer, Pfizer put me in touch with, with clinicians in London who, um, and you think it was a strange relationship because Pfizer produced the antifungal drug that's toxic and costly, but actually um, they, it became obvious it, we're not providing a companion diagnostic for their drug, so we're very, we keep them well away, but they have, they're treating the patients, and they, they, to be fair to Pfizer, they want to treat them properly. And that in fact, their drug can only be administered with a, with a definitive diagnostic test. The other companies that produ produce the drugs can give them without diagnostic, so they can be used prophylactically rather than with a, a diagnostic-driven identification. So it, it, it was, it's been a very good relationship, and in fact, they've given us access to people all over the world and I've done educational videos with them, one of which is on the ISCA website. So we're, we're trying to help developing countries. They're trying to help, you know, they're, they're boosting their sales of their drug, but at the same time, they're helping me, you know, and I've got an extremely good relationship with them. Um, and they've, they've been extremely helpful. Um, and you need the drugs. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, pharma companies, they make massive profits, but you have to treat these patients. So they're, 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 they're doing an important job. But clinicians, yeah, really important. And on that note, perhaps we'll thank Chris again. Thank you. So listen, we're going to change tack a little bit now, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Oliver Blackwell to the stage. Oliver is the CEO of Clinical Design, and we're going to be hearing about his journey right now. So Oliver. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a uh, product designer, industrial designer, so uh, come with a very different uh, perspective to, to that of the academics and the clinicians in the room. Um, I'll tell you how it all started. So I had a dislocated shoulder. I went to go and see my doctor and uh, he said, oh, I've, I've got an idea. Um, shall we work on it? And I said, um, as I often say when I say what I do for a living, I said, yep, thanks very much. See you later. And um, unfortunately, the injury was persistent and so was the doctor. And so we started working on his idea. And the first product that, uh, that we looked at was a product called uh, the Painless Cannula. Um, and this was a method of using um, a cannula and ultimately eliminating, eliminating the procedural problems and therefore the pain associated with the, cannula, the cannulation. Um, and this is what the product looked like. We did an, a, a huge amount of research at the time and realized that actually we needed about five million pounds to get the product to market. And as a, as a doctor with a bit of ambition and a designer, this was a, a bit of a feat. So we parked it. It was picked up subsequently by the BBC and it was, it was dubbed the pain-free needle. And it was a fantastic product. But at that particular point in time, we went our, went our separate ways and I started, uh, started looking at this particular product. So. Um, my favorite subject of all, urine. <laughs> so those of you that aren't familiar with it, there are 2.8 billion urine tests undertaken globally um, every year. Um, and it's exactly the same test whether you're in um, a Bush clinic in the Sudan or whether you're in the Mayo clinic. 
and it involves the process of using a, a stick which has pieces of paper that change colour in accordance to different parameters in the urine. Um, and then you have to read the colours off against the chart, often using human eye, which can result in a, a high number of uh, inaccurate results and potentially overprescription of antibiotics. There is the use of a digital analyzer, which are, depending on uh, the sophistication of the healthcare provider, um, they're not commonplace in, particularly in primary care in the UK, as an example. And this is simply cost prohibitive, not necessarily the desire to perform best practice. So I'll talk you through the process. So the healthcare provider would put on a pair of gloves, they'd walk over to the sink, they would unscrew the lid, they would get a stick, dip it in, out, they would scrape excess on the edge, trying not to knock it over, and then they would go through the procedure of reading the colours off on the side of the chart by going up and down, backwards and forwards, trying to use a watch and read specific times, reading at 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 45 seconds, reading four different colours at exactly 60 seconds, and then waiting two minutes to read the final result. Inaccurate timings, inaccurate readings generate an inaccurate result. So constantly look, looking backwards and forwards between the stopwatch and the chart. So after the test is complete, there are three items that have got to be discarded. If the sample needs to go to the lab for further analysis, it's, it's decanted into a, another container which requires labeling, and this would then go in a van to the lab for further, for further tests. So back at the patient, they've got to think, what were the results? Then they've got to either manually type them in, or they've got to go through the, the fantastic old-fashioned way of writing on a piece of paper, using some sellotape to attach the results to the notes, which often come out when the, when the sellotape dries out. So to summarize, it's, it can be inaccurate, uh, particularly unpleasant, and uh, an inefficient me method for testing urine. So I'll tell you a little bit about clinical design and, and how, how I'm here. So our product is a small consumable uh, urine testing device. So this is, the, this is the, uh, the cap and contains exactly the same chemistry that's found on a, a conventional stick. So the product uh, docks on top of a urine sample. There's an internal puck pin, which, you might, which is in the top part, and that ruptures a membrane. The product is inverted, allowing the urine to soak into the chemical pads. It's then invert, re-inverted and then placed into a digital analyzer. The results are fed directly onto the uh, clinician's PC, uh, where they can be uploaded into the electronic patient record. So we raised 1.8 million pounds two years ago to get this business off the ground. And um, when I was preparing my slides, I sort of said, what, what angle, how would you like me to, 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 to prepare for my presentation? So I said oh, a little bit about how you did it, how you got going. So, I thought I would do exactly that and just talk you through how I, how I raised this money, because it's a huge amount of money for one guy, a, a bit of ambition and idea. So this is exactly how I did it. Uh, lots of meetings, telephone calls, uh, lots of train trips, meetings, emails, telephone calls, travel, meetings, you're getting the message now, telephone calls, meetings, emails, presentations, more emails, et cetera, et cetera. So, there was a huge amount of personal investment in, into this particular project, and there was no secret other than a huge amount of hard work and persuading everyone I met that I had a great idea and, and you should invest in it. So I was then asked, okay, patience. There's a huge amount of my personal patience involved in believing what in, in what I'm doing. Um, and then I, I came across this slide, which sort of, typified it halfway through the investment process, it's, it is very much an uphill struggle. But I do have one, one technique that I do, I always believe you do your absolute best that you th think you can, and then you just make that one more telephone call. And in the investment process, that proved to be hugely wealthy, and hugely, hugely helpful, and often it was, that person wasn't of any particular, any particular interest to our fundraise, but they would know someone that was, and that's how we got it going. Um, so, we had to build a pretty compelling business case to get this off the ground. And the design process uh, is very similar to the business process where it's constantly iterating and changing and moving forward. Um, so this is one of the early prototypes. Um, and in fact, we've now made uh, almost a thousand particular prototypes on what is a very, very simple, small little plastic cap. 
And this was one of our one of our first prototypes, which was a huge, ugly, heavy, complicated, um, and and ultimately it was it was not a commercially viable viable proposition. Um, so we then went to this this sort of second method, which was um, equally as ugly, but 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 it was slightly almost there. Um, and then we realized that um, by spending a huge amount of time with, with, with clinicians and putting my, putting my foot in door in labs and saying, oh, can I come in and have a chat? And then once I was in, once people would recognize me, no one would ever question why I was in there. And I've been in places that I should never have been allowed, but it's allowed me to get these, these key insights to develop the product. So there was, a, there was a quite an interesting shift in the industry where uh, laboratories wanted the samples in test tubes because they didn't want to have to decant them. There was a, there was a time and therefore a cost associated with decanting. And there was also a risk associated with relabeling. So I thought, actually, if it's smaller, we could potentially make it cheaper. So I've, I've engaged with a number of very high profile hospitals, uh, some of the very best in the land to be able to get the to, get to access the top clinicians to be able to tell me absolute brutal truth. Is this product really any good? So there's been a huge amount of thinking, time, and, uh, and, and evaluating what, what we're really doing here. And this is, whilst I can't show you the final product, we're about three months away from launch. This is, in essence, something very similar to the product that we're launching. Um, so you might have come across uh, this, particular, this particular lady, Elizabeth Holmes. So she was America's first, um, first made billionaire. So uh, a couple of years ago, she was valued at uh, nine billion. Um, at the moment, she's currently being investigated for fraud under the FDA. She had some very fantastic technology, but it transpires that it, it wasn't really ever there. Um, but what she did do for us was she highlighted the fact that um, the industry was shifting and people wanted the ability to be able to, they wanted to be empowered to, to manage their own health in a better way and have greater transparency between the patient um, and the healthcare provider. So we took this on board and thought, okay, we want to provide absolutely the best possible product. So what we had done is we had said, the conventional stick's pretty good, it's well-known technology. And we were using a, a chart where you had very similar colors and you could compare color for color and you could perform your, uh, you perform your diagnosis. But we thought, we can do better than this. So we thought, we'll develop a digital analyzer as well. But wh what we wanted to do was we wanted to make it absolutely affordable. So that this would be located next to every computer with every clinician. Um, so we thought, I know what, forget that, scrap that, everyone's got an iPhone, move to an iPhone. But what we failed to remember was this is absolutely an accurate medical, medical device. So we then developed this product, and unfortunately, once again, I can't show you our final, our final analyzer because it's, we're at the, fi the patent filing stage at the moment. Um, so Siemens and Roche are two huge, huge companies in this sector. They occupy 60, 70% of the market. Um, and the rest is made up of, of generic uh, brands from, from Europe and from the Far East. Um, and our business model is based upon the HP model, whereby we have a digital analyzer that we will sell at a very low cost, and we actually make our money on selling the consumables, which is exactly the same way as selling, selling the ink cartridges. And this is a very common model, model now in the, in the medical device industry. So, what do we do? We, we recognize that the chemistry has been around since 1964. And, and I'm not a clinician. I have no clinical training. Um, I'm a product designer. But what I am able to do is I'm able to interview people. I'm able to share prototypes. And I'm able to understand and take that feedback and convert it into a product. So we use the same technology. We also did the same with our analyzer and recognized that reflectance photometry, which this is actually a Roche document, is um, is a really, really accurate way of analyzing color. So we do exactly the same as, exactly the same as everyone else. Um, so as a business, we've been funded by um, 13 investors who are, have supported us. And we've also been supported by the European Union um, to grow our business. And what we've done with that money is we filed um, six patents. We are highly likely to, I would say, 90% chance of having all of those patents granted. Um, we have invested heavily in a highly automated assembly line, which allows us to manufacture the, the product at a, a cost that means that we can be highly competitive in the marketplace. And we've also building up a fantastic team of people that, that believe in what we're doing and are passionate about our goal. So to summarize, we have a sealed and hygienic solution. Uh, we're offering a product that's highly accurate, yet is affordable, that provides fast, definitive results that are completely integrated with patients' electronic notes. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much for that. That was fantastic. Um, we've got time for some questions from the floor. Paul, uh, microphone's just coming. Always the challenge, uh, uh, Oliver, cost versus existing. Yes. So um, we will be within 5% uh, of the existing sticks for our consumable part, and our analyzer will be one-fifth of the, the cheapest product on the market, which is always a difficult area because people often perceive cheap as being lacking in quality, potentially. Yeah. Um, but we recognize there are uh, a lot of functionality associated with the existing products. We also recognize that uh, there's a lot of margin being made by some of the larger companies with those particular products. Because we're able to put a, a sealed sealed item into a, into a device as opposed to a, a urine soak stick means that we can perform a, a it's, it's far more simple um, mechanically. Um, yeah. So there's no, in essence, there's no moving parts in our product. So because of that, we've really stripped it back to the, um, the core basics, which is accurate color reading. Um, and that's how we can how we can achieve a low a low cost and therefore make our business work. Hopefully, is the fluorimetry essential to uh, accurate diagnosis, or can you just eyeball it? Uh, <laughs> it it is is absolutely essential. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Just wondering if I could just ask a question. So you sort of explained your journey a little bit, but I was just curious as to how you made the leap into this urine testing uh, device as opposed to. Anything else yeah. in particular? So there's a, at any one point in time, there's probably, there's probably 20 products that I'm thinking about working on. Um, and I worked with a GP for a number of years and, and it was engaging with him and engaging with urologists, engaging with every consultant that had ever had anything or knew loosely about urine. They had a valid opinion. And so we really ultimately, because I recognize my weaknesses as a non-clinician, has also been the, the strength because I can I can ask and I can listen and I have to take those opinions on board. So that's how I've really done it is, is going out and talking to as many people that will possibly talk to me as I can. Thank you. So, so perhaps one more question just up here, if we can bring the mic back. Yeah. Sorry if I missed at the start, but um, I just wonder what your actual background was in terms of technical training yeah. and also out of interest whether the pain-free injection is going anywhere or that's just been yeah. parked forever. Okay, um, so my background, I'm an um, industrial designer, so most people know it as a, as a product designer. Um, I'm, um, I've got accredited chartered designer status um, and I spent 12 years running a, a small design consultancy um, and worked on everything from agricul agricultural equipment through to uh, cookware, I suppose, and then I realized that my passion was in medical devices as a result of working with clinicians. Um, and felt that this was sort of my, my calling as a designer. Um, and yeah, I found that there's a, as a, as a real, you, as a designer, you can get closer to the optimum solution whereby you've got a patient that's been treated, it's, it's affordable by the healthcare provider, and you're providing a, a definitive, definitive, accurate result. So that's my, that's my background. And your second question? It, it was whether the, uh, the injection idea yeah, so is going the, anywhere. So it was a fantastic product. Um, as, as all of the ideas I work with, um, you have to go through a, um, a business evaluation. Um, and that particular product, the, 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 the opportunity for it was relatively limited. Um, and when evaluating it against other products that I might have been developing at the time, it, it was lower down on the list. And unfortunately, due to the way the patent system works, is you have to invest heavily. So we've, we've probably spent over £100,000 on patents. And, and, and you don't get anything back from that other than the ability to trade and protect your business, which a lot of people will argue is obviously of great value, but it's only of great value if you've got something to sell and make a profit. Um, and on the back of an idea with nothing to sell, nothing to trade, and then to be able to persuade investors to move forward, that was going to be a more difficult sell than some other products that I was working on. So it was, it was parked, and it's just the design files sit on my computer, and it's, it's a great shame, but it's there with lots of others and uh, whilst I go and interview and remain open-minded, there will always be more that can come. So I don't, feel, I don't feel bad about it at all. Oliver, thank you very much for that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move into our final talk now, and again, a bit of a change of tack, but one of the other key things that was highlighted in the Life Sciences uh, Strategy Report that Sir John Bell prepared for government 
was the need to actually partner much more strongly with the NHS and the NHS Trust. So it's a real pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Adrian Harris, to talk to us a little bit about the NHS and hopefully opportunities for us to get better involved. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Adrian Harris. I'm the uh, medical director at the RDE. That's the uh, the local teaching hospital. Um, the medical director is uh, the head doctor, sits on the board. Uh, but I'm not the chief exec, but the chief exec wouldn't be able to give this talk um, <laughs> in her defence. And uh, my background is I'm a, an emergency physician, an A&E consultant. So um, I'd, that's what I'm going to cover. Uh, we're going to be pressed for time, so you can all read. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about the RD&E. Um, we are a standalone teaching hospital. Uh, we're an integrated healthcare provider, and what that means is we not only run an acute service, but we run our uh, community services. Um, we service a local population of about uh, 500,000 and about three quarters of a million on a wider footprint. And uh, we can beat the university, our turnover is about 500,000. Uh, and as you can see, we're relatively cheap because you get uh, 8,000 staff for that, not four and a half. So, uh, you know, we're uh, uh, more efficient, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but you can pick the bones out of that. Okay, um, lots of doctors spend lots of time, lots of medical doctors spend lots of time navel-gazing about whether medicine is a science or an art. Uh, and I certainly have my views, but I can tell you that all the great advances in what I do are due to pure science. Uh, science really matters to us. Uh, and uh, the national direction of bringing science closer to medicine, uh, closer to the NHS, is hugely welcome. And, uh, you know, that slide demonstrates um, why science uh, is important. Uh, particularly, we are running out of money. Uh, it's almost impossible to open a paper today within the UK uh, looking at the NHS without cost being absolutely, uh, you know, front and centre. Uh, and therefore, we need to be really accurate in every pence or pound that we spend, and clearly science can drive that. Um, you know, so Oliver's presentation, had he said he was 5% cheaper than a medi stick, uh, he'd, he'd have my absolute attention. But the bottom line is um, money really, really does talk. Okay, so what have we done so far? I'm just going to describe some of our successes and then I'm going to talk a bit about the opportunities and just how open for business we are at the RD&E. Um, the Exeter Hip has put uh, Exeter absolutely on the map in terms of orthopaedics, developed by uh, Robin Ling, who uh, uh, is memorial, is uh, in a week or two's time, died last year uh, in 1970. It is the most common cemented hip in the world. It's been done in conjunction with a company called Stryker and evolves constantly. Uh, and, you know, clearly two million to date is a huge number. Um, a local study uh, that uh, was done in my own department um, by... Uh, Andrew Applebaum, which uh, SVT is a, um, a supraventricular tachycardia. Your heart is beating too fast, often treated with dangerous drugs uh, or cardioversion shock. Um, Andrew did a brilliant piece of work and demonstrated by a simple manoeuvre you could uh, improve the rate of reversion back to a normal rhythm from 5% to 40% simply by combining a Valsalva manoeuvre that some of you will be uh, familiar with, with raising the legs. An incredibly simple concept, uh, published in The Lancet, now being adopted uh, internationally. To add to that, they've come up with a device to uh, ensure that a Valsalva is done accurately. One of the problems is trying to persuade uh, patients to Valsalva accurately, and that's being done in conjunction with a local company. Um, stop cuts. Uh, this is a really interesting one. These socks have got Kevlar in them, uh, in the same way that your, well, not yours, I don't suppose many of you wear flak jackets on a regular basis, <laughs> but were you to be wearing a flak jacket, you would have the same stuff as stop, uh, stop cuts have. Uh, elderly patients, particularly over 65, those on steroids, diabetics, are very vulnerable to getting what we call pretibial lacerations, cuts on their lower leg. 
Um, and the consequences of those are huge economically um, as uh, they go on to, some of these go on to develop ulcers. Ulcers cost the NHS £2.4 billion pounds a year. Um, clearly, stop cuts isn't going to um, ameliorate that completely, but by wearing these, an early feasibility study has demonstrated a significant improvement in the reduction of pretibial lacerations. So, a very simple idea, um, but with a, a real, I guess, translational and patient benefit. Uh, and then, of course, I guess what we're most famous for is our clever science around genetic sequencing and lab work, uh, particularly the work by professors uh, Hattersley and Ellard in diabetes. Um, they've identified 16 subtypes of genetic diabetes so far, uh, four of which they've got treatments for, and Tarek Ahmed is doing some really groundbreaking work in terms of um, antibody production to new generation biologics, which is a clear marker of failure of treatment. And if you can identify that your expensive biologic treatment is no longer working, you can stop and save the money that you would be pouring into the patients unsuccessfully. So to give you a feel for that, we do all of this uh, antibody work for, um, for bowel uh, in the UK. We do all the genetic testing for diabetes for the UK and for 95 countries internationally. How do we do it? Well, we, we, we are part of a huge network, and this university, of course, is part of that network. And I, I don't have time, uh, nor would it probably be appropriate, to go through all of the various elements on this slide. But one of the things that has uh, become very clear to me in my role as the medical director and therefore responsible for research at the rd &E is just how collaboration is what all this is about. Uh, and that only by collaborating can we uh, move forward together. And so um, our role within that wider uh, structure is crucial to us. Uh, and within that, the Academic Health Science Network, and I think somebody from the AHSN is here, is really crucial. They are the glue that links together all the component parts. Uh, these are our local hospitals, and we collaborate and feedback with them. Uh, that allows us a regional uh, position in conjunction with the universities and so forth. But of course the AHSM provides a major link to the rest of the UK uh, and that very much fits with the direction of travel in terms of an alliance between science and the NHS. Um, we're quite good at what we do. We're not the best, but we're quite good. So we are in the, um, we're in the second league of uh, NHS hospitals, so I guess uh, in football parlance we're in the championship, not the premiership, uh, we're not UCL, um, but we are top of the championship. Uh, our performance in uh, time to opening um, first patient recruited uh, is above the national benchmarking and we're the top ranking recruiter amongst acute hospitals. Remember we have moved from being a D district general to a teaching hospital over the last 15 years, but nevertheless we're the 13th highest performing teaching hospital. It might be 16th, 13th or 16th, 13th. So you know we're proud of that because uh, we, you know we're coming up on the rails. Um, so practical tips if you want to uh, work with us. Please engage with us early. Uh, clinical input into your brilliant ideas will stop those ideas developing too far before someone says, do you know what, we're never going to buy this, we're not, we're, this isn't going to work. Try and align your idea with our priorities and need, and the way to do that is to talk to us, to have discussions, say what will work for us. Do robust feasibility, it, it's crucial that it is doable, um, and uh, be realistic about the time and the money involved, you know, the best you can do is six years uh, in terms of getting a grant, doing the study, getting it published. And then, of course, you've got to persuade someone to adopt it. Uh, and uh, as you all know, that can take years or indeed never. And, of course, uh, I carry responsibility uh, for mortality and safety at the rd &E, and this is absolutely dear to my heart that we have to remember that at the, end of, at the end of these studies is a person, somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's daughter, somebody's son, and so patient choice and safety is absolutely paramount. When does it work best? When it works best is when it's embedded, 
and when it's close to the patient. We are very much at that end of the research spectrum. So, uh, what are our key strategies? Well, we want to work in partnership with the university and industry. And I'll say this again, we are very much open for business and open to collaborate. I guess we have had a change of heart over the last few years. Uh, and uh, that's personally something I am driving very, very hard. They are an absolute priority for us, research and innovation. Uh, what are the opportunities? Well, we have a big biobank in which we store excess samples of both tissue and blood that can be researched on subsequently. That is an opportunity for the UK and indeed for the local uh, research community. We've got a state-of-the-art facility. Some of you will have seen it, the Toblerone up on Barrack Road, which uh, is full of bright people uh, champing at the bit to do more work. Um, we are getting into data. We've got a lot of research data, and of course we've got an enormous amount of clinical records. And I was hoping to be able to make a, a key announcement about just how accessible those records will become in the near future. Uh, and I think in two weeks' time I'll be able to do that. So um, you can try and read the coded message behind that. <laughs> but data is key to us. We have now created our first tranche of academic departments, and these, I would advise, uh, sh uh, should it interest you, will be the most fertile ground uh, in terms of engaging with clinicians. So that is uh, Andy Applebaum, the revert um, uh, study guy. Uh, and interestingly, when I ran that department for many years, when he came to me and told me about what I dismissively called the lying downy blowy study, uh, <laughs> I told him uh, it wouldn't work, no one would ever buy it, and he'd never change practice. How wrong I was. So these are our new academic departments. We're really proud of them. Uh, they're well chosen. They're well chosen because they have a proven track record of uh, obtaining grants and delivering high quality research leading to publications. And what's more, leading to change that uh, matters to patients. Um, uh, I'm sure I can uh, circulate these slides and you know, you're free to use them uh, for contacts. Um, we are developing a joint office with the university uh, and the reason behind that is because we have taken the view that uh, getting into this work is overly complex. We make it difficult. One of my challenges to the researchers in this room is you love making it difficult. I don't know why you do, but you do. And as someone who comes from a much more operational and strategic background, you know, I will constantly challenge you to simplify the process. Just because it was hard for you doesn't mean it needs to be hard for the next generation. We need to move forward together. So we're looking to simplify and demystify the process. Where could we do better? Well, we can do better in all domains, but we're particularly interested in what we can do better in terms of innovation. We feel that we have been too primary research focused in terms of innovation, and we need to be more receptive to the uh, needs of industry or business around us. And for that reason, uh, we are involving our business development director, Dave Tarbot, and we're about to appoint a clinical lead for innovation who's likely to be Pete Ford, though I haven't confirmed that with him, so don't, <laughs> don't tell him that. Um, and we're working on what we're calling a pipeline process. We, and um, without going into the details, essentially this is to make uh, the, uh, the RD&E receptive to the innovative needs of our local business and research community uh, to try and demystify the process. Clearly, um, confidentiality will be hugely important for all the reasons the previous speakers have uh, talked about. And coming to us with a brilliant idea carries risk we will uh, protect you in terms of confidentiality agreements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> so my final slide, how's that for timing? <laughs> um, look, we we're late to market in terms of research. We recognize that. Um, we have got this fantastic university. Uh, I mean, look at this facility we're standing in today. Uh, in the same city, um, when Chris Whitty came down, uh, Chief Scientific Officer, he, he said to me, look, Adrian, there's a couple of things you need to focus on. You need to focus on old people. Your community is probably the oldest in England. If you don't research on old people, you are letting the country down. And he said, you've got a rising star of a university 
get into bed with that university and drive forward that agenda. That was music to my ears, uh, and I absolutely agree with that. So we are very much uh, open for business in terms of innovation and research, and you know we will put money, effort, people, and talent, uh, put those shoulders to the wheel um, in the interest of you know our local population, the patients we serve, and I guess in the long term uh, the UK. So, uh, any questions? Do we have any questions? Just uh, one here at the front. Thanks. Um, I noticed on your academic groupings you haven't got infectious diseases. Yeah. They didn't get over the bar, so we ran a competitive uh, recruitment process. Uh, and the, the uh, recruitment was um, relatively stringent in terms of you had to have a certain number of grant active uh, academics, you had to have a track record in established uh, grants and indeed publications so far. Uh, so far, and that's where we've got to now. The process will continue, we'll run rounds over the years uh, and you know I think infectious diseases are a strong department uh, and they may get over the bar but unfortunately there has to be winners and they have to be losers. So I guess the line to that, um, obviously the drivers for these departments are the clinical excellence. Now you mentioned obviously partnering with the university. Now the university also has centres of excellence that may or may not necessarily map on. So is there anything we can do collectively, I guess, to try and ensure that you know the areas map as well as they possibly can? I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, so I um, meet regularly with, uh, I guess, the higher echelons of the, uh, the university in terms of um, developing a memorandum of understanding in terms of how we will work with the university. But in terms of uh, aligning our various research uh, interests, that is a clear priority. And, in, uh, you know, a classic example of that would be the appointment of Clive Ballard that absolutely maps to uh, the need in the dementia space and, uh, and uh, uh, older people. Um, and I think this is an area that we will need to focus on more and more. And certainly uh, from the RDNE's point of view, if the university came to us and said, we would really like to drive forward, say, infectious diseases, you know, we would be very receptive. Uh, I've got to be clear, we have no spare money. You know, we, we are remarkably uh, tight at the moment, uh, and that ain't going to change. But we, we are prepared to invest what we can. Just got one more question over here. Excellent talk. You've emphasised the, the importance of innovation and its role. How, what do you see as missing? I mean, my, my impression of uh, in, innovation across the board, and I've had a lot of experience of it, is that um, most of the activities of most organisations are very tactical and sporadic in nature and superficial quite often. Yeah. Uh, and it's pot potluck whether you know, the thing you chuck at the wall sticks or not. I'm looking at it very much from a more strategic point of view and trying to bring some doctrine to it. Yeah. Uh, do you see a need for that? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, so the, the, the word I use is culture. Uh, we do not have a culture of innovation at the RDNE. We have some early adopters, we have a few acolytes, and we have an awful lot of Luddites. Uh, the way to change it is to change the culture, and that comes from the top. And, and, and to be fair, the reason we are where we are today is because we've had a change of chief exec, and she absolutely wants this to happen. Uh, to be fair to her, her name Suzanne Tracy, to be fair to her, she, she knows it's important. She doesn't really understand quite what we mean when we talk about innovation and research in this space, but she absolutely is creating the uh, desire to deliver this. Well, I'd be happy um, to come and talk to you about the way I look at it and see whether it can be no, a so, And you know, Do come and talk to me and we will you know, put you in touch with people. Um, there are departments that are very uh, open to innovation and of course there are departments that are absolutely not. My challenge, our challenge, is to ensure that all departments are. You know, our highest ambition is that every single patient will be offered the opportunity to be in a clinical trial. That's where we want to be, we believe that to be the right place to be, but it will take many years to get to that place. But it's a journey we're on and it's one we'll, you know, uh, pursue resolutely because it's in everyone's interest. Thank you. Okay, Adrian. Oh, perhaps just one final quick question here. Um, 
I was wondering how much of a problem it is um, to get clinicians to adopt new techniques and strategies. So I was thinking about it in terms of Oliver's talk and also in the revert strategy. As scientists, we want, you know, the ideal situation is for us, for our research to be used, but is that a real struggle to get clinicians? Is it good enough to have a great product? Or no, a no, it isn't, is it? You know that. So there are some fantastic innovations that have not been adopted. Um, I think that a key element to this is this early engagement, that it, it has to have an element of co-production. Uh, you know, we are deeply distrustful human beings uh, uh, clinicians. We, are, we like what we know and uh, stepping into the no unknown is, is, is scary uh, and for that reason to take, taking us on the journey is, is uh, extremely helpful. Um, there is a massive na national directive to uh, speed up the adoption curve because frankly you know I can't remember where it's at. I think it's at 14 years now it was out at 20 you know that is unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable on the background of no money because most of the innovations are around, a lot of innovations around cost efficiency and accuracy. So, you know, the presentation we had about IPA in terms of accuracy is, is, is killer, isn't it? Because if, if we know that we're doing the right thing now, we're saving money rather than the sort of slightly blunderbuss approach we often have to take. Okay, so on that note, uh, it's my duty to draw proceedings to a close here. So I think we've had four fantastic talks this morning. They've covered different aspects of translational research from different perspectives. We've seen different models for how that can look from a, a researcher going into becoming a CEO to a researcher staying as a researcher but running a company on the side. We've seen product design and how that can come in and then we've seen from the total other side of the spectrum, what are the real drivers behind how we actually see research translated? So I think, you know, Exist, thanks for putting together those four speakers. They're really fantastic. Um, in terms of what happens now, there should be more tea and coffee outside, and that will enable us to continue networking. I know many of you are quite busy and may have to get off, but we do have a list of emails of everyone here today. Really do encourage people to get in contact with each other, if you want to continue the conversations. And there's also an opportunity to have a brief tour of the LSI and have a look at some of the space here, some of the opportunities for uh, wider engagement between the university and external partners. Hopefully some of you will be able to come on that. Um, and it's just left for me to say thank you very much for taking the time to come and join us here in the Living Systems Institute today and exist. Thank you very much for hosting, allowing us to host your event. Thank you. <laughs>